So if you would turn again with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Not chapter 4, chapter 5. And our text is found in that chapter in verse 11 this evening. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. The theme is yet again the preaching of the cross. Um, each one that I do, I come to the conclusion this is the last one and then some more light is given and away we go again. So the preaching of the cross is uh, the theme once again. The dying love of Jesus Christ dominates and drives the Apostle Paul. He considers himself not worthy to be called an apostle, he says. He says, I was a blasphemer. He says, I cursed amongst the best and the worst of them. I was an injurious man. I was a violent man, but I obtained mercy. And his meeting with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he would never, never forget as long as he drew breath and then for all eternity. The dying that Jesus Christ should die on the cross for a wicked sinner such as he. And the theme of the cross, the preaching of the cross, it's his driving force, it's his motive. He is tireless um, in the preaching of the cross. Relentless in his pursuit of lost sinners that they too, like him, might obtain mercy and be brought back to God. He tells the Roman Christians, chapter 1, verse 15, that he is ready, he is ever ready to preach the gospel to any and all who will listen. He's ready to preach the gospel to them. And then he goes on in verse 18 to tell them why. He says, because a sword of justice hangs over the entirety of an apostate human race that has departed from God. The wrath of God, he says, hangs over them. And there is but one way by which that sword of justice can be removed. And that's through faith in the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. Believing the word of the cross. A human race that has departed from God and is being given over as our society even today. Romans chapter 1, beloved in Christ, that's where we are at as a, a nation today, as a society. Read Romans chapter 1, that's us. Given over to reprobate minds. Given over to all manner of madness by God. And one way of escape, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of the virgin, made of a woman, made under the law, to deliver those under the curse of the law. The cross, the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross, where sin is dealt fully and finally and emphatically by God, so that Paul can say in verse 17, therefore, if any man, whether he be like him, a blasphemer, a violent man, whoever, whatever he is, if he is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. The old sin life is gone completely, emphatically done away with by God. Sent away into the land of forgetfulness where not even God himself can find it. Paul, we here tonight likewise have obtained mercy. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, now he says we have been given this ministry. That's he, his fellow preachers, that's the church, that's the church today, that's us, that's we, us. We have obtained mercy and we have been given a ministry. We have been given a stewardship of the word of the cross, the preaching of the cross. 
In chapter 4 and verse 2 also, he says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We handle this, this, this uh, stewardship. We conduct ourselves with honesty and with integrity. There's nothing hidden. We hold nothing back to men and women. They've got a sword of justice hanging over them. They're sitting, as it were, enjoying their sin on the precipice of hell. And we dare not hold anything back from them. We tell them about their state in sin, conceived in sin, born in sin, living in sin. And they will die in sin unless, by the grace of God, they are saved through the word of the cross. We bring God's righteous law to bear upon them so that they can understand that they grasp, that they get it, the kind of sinners that they are. Not that they can be saved by the law, far from it. But the law is given to educate us, a schoolmaster to teach us what kind of sinners it is that we are, to shred our self-righteousness and cause us to see that desperately we need somebody to save us and that person is Jesus Christ who died on the cross. And now he says here in our chapter, chapter 5 and verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are just spokesmen, that's all. We are, we are messengers. We have this ministry, the preaching of the cross. We have a vital and we have an urgent message to deliver. And like Paul, deliver it, we must, through the preaching of the cross. So three things under the heading, the preaching of the cross, the terror, the persuasion, and the cross. The terror. Knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul says. There are two sides to the cross and the preaching of the cross. It is the manifestation of God's love. It is the only manifestation of God's love. Look where you will in all the world. Look at humanity and you'll see nothing but the wrath and displeasure of God. In all the universe, the galaxies, the world, creatures great and small, nothing, nothing, nothing of the love of God. Herein is the love of God that he gave his only begotten son up to the death of the cross. There is your definition of love. The cross, Christ, the Son of God, dying for sinners that they might obtain mercy. Undeserved, unmerited mercy from God. But the other side of the cross that's so seldom mentioned is the awesome, terrible wrath of God. That darkness that came upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the curse that he bore, the wrath that he bore in the place of sinners on that cross, the appalling darkness. Perhaps maybe, maybe I could do another series after this, the revealed wrath in the cross. That would be an interesting subject, would it not? Oh, you say, no, no, Jimmy, that would be, oh, that would not be edifying. Yes, it would. Because I tell you, I, I tell you where to see that and to feel it, it would drive us the more to Christ. We would be, beloved, we would be, we would be ready to swim shark-infested waters to get to Jesus. But Paul here, he, he, he speaks, the time of our demise is coming, he says, for we know, we know this, we understand this, yeah? That if our earthly house of this tabernacle, our bodies that is, were dissolved and we have a building of God, we've got a place to go. A house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. When we lay our bodies in the grave, uh, we've got somewhere to go. If we're trusting in Jesus, we've got a heavenly mansion. If not, then it's a hellish hovel. If you're going to be thrown out your house tonight, you would want to have somewhere comfortable to go, wouldn't you? Well, soon, says Paul, you're going to be thrown out the house of your body. It's appointed, 
It's appointed, he says in Hebrews 9 verse 27, divinely appointed unto men once to die. Oh, says the unbeliever, then that's it, all over. No more suffering, that's it. Finito, black hole, end of story. Nobody knows what happens afterwards. Yes, he says, after this comes the judgment. For the believer, of course, this is the believer's desire, says Paul. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We desire that we long for it. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we pray. Because there is no fear. There is no fear in death for the believer. It's been conquered, that sting has been removed. There's no fear of judgment. Yes, we must all appear before the judgment throne of Christ, he says. But for the believer, that's a judgment of commendation, not com condemnation. So we can be confident, that is, con fide, con with fide, faith. We can be with faith, we can be with confidence. Knowing that our sin has been dealt with. Knowing that there is no fear. Free from fear, the Apostle John, he says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But the other side of that, the other side of that, unbelief, knowing the terror of the Lord. We have a sign that we use on the streets. It defines what we term a hate crime is. Yeah? Not telling sinners that they're going to hell. Knowing the terror of the Lord. How dare we, how can we remain silent? Huh? I mean the fear of death is enough, is it not? Job, he terms death to be the king of terrors. Sadly in our modern society, that's no longer the case. Because people are, are given, well, they call it, uh, I've got another word for it, but they call it end-of-life treatment. And they're drugged up to the eyeballs. So they step out of this world into eternity and into the, into the judgment hall of God, totally oblivious to the fact that that's where they're going. But to know, to know, the terror of the Lord, to be persuaded from the truth. Joel 2 verse 31, the great and terrible day of the Lord we know. And therefore, because we know, we seek to persuade men and women to be reconciled to God. Because there is a day coming for every single one of them that will unite time with eternity when the two shall meet. And Paul, he tells us that the judge, the ju we don't know when the day is, but the judge has been appointed and he shall appear. Acts 17, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge, judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised them from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Fire will come down from heaven. A great white throne shall be, shall be erected. And the one who sits on it, the mighty son of God, with eyes like flames of fire, a mighty trumpet blast that will fill the whole entire universe. The graves will be opened. The sea will give up its dead. The dead will be raised. There will be the dissolution of the earth. A universal convocation where every tribe, nation, and every single person 
shall stand before the judgment throne of Jesus Christ and the books will be opened. The books of men's consciences, everything that they ever thought, everything they ever spoke, everything that they ever did, even every idle word, says Jesus, shall be accounted for. Publishing every man and woman's sins right across the universe for all to see and know in that day. Revelation chapter 6, and the kings of the earth and great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the sentence will be pronounced. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer, outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The infliction, says the lovely Lord Jesus Christ, the affliction, infliction of wrath, torments that will endure forever, devouring fire, everlasting burnings, a bottomless pit, and the smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever and ever. Beloved in Christ, the youngest Christian who has read the Bible once, just once, knows these things. We know these things. Why? Because what I have, the account that I have just given you is from the Bible almost word for word. Not my opinion. Not even my desires. But we know this. It has been revealed to us. And because we know it, because it has been revealed to us, in the truth of Scripture, the just and holy demands of God's holiness. Beloved in Christ, man's own conscience testifies. And God cannot and God will not change. He won't lift the bar. The standard of his holy law remains. And all these things have already been foreshadowed in redemption's history. You've got the account in Noah's day. You've got the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. All these things, the Apostle Peter tells us, all these things are there for us as examples so that we might know, know the terror of the Lord. And knowing the terror of the Lord, flee from it into the arms of Jesus, the only Savior. Knowing this, we appeal to men and women, verse 20. We appeal, we pray you in Christ's stead, because of these things, be ye reconciled to God. Through faith in the Son of God. Therefore, secondly, the persuasion. Because of this, because we know this, we persuade men, we seek to persuade men. Preaching in Glasgow just the other week, a man I perceived that he was a Christian, he came up and he said to us, oh, he said, preach love, he said, not fear. No, no, we preach the truth. We preach the whole truth. We preach the whole counsel of God. We preach both sides of the cross. The love and the wrath of God visited upon the Son of God that we might escape such an end, that we might escape the terror of the Lord. No, we preach the truth. We preach the truth and love, of course, but we preach the whole truth. We preach the cross. Man's only escape route. 
And so we seek to persuade men, says Paul. We seek to press them. We seek to urge them. There's urgency. This is what drives the apostle. Because he was once in the self same place himself under the displeasure of God. So we seek to persuade, we seek to press, we seek to urge men to be reconciled to God concerning all that God has spoken. Not just teaching, that's part of it, but not just preaching is unique. In preaching, we seek to persuade men. We seek to press them. We seek to urge them because there is urgency. And preaching is a means of grace. It's the means by which men and women come to be reconciled to God. How then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is the very means by which people, people come to faith, come to salvation, escape the terrors of the Lord. Preaching is evangelizing. Bringing the good news of the message, the word of the cross, that through the word of the cross that men and women might be reconciled to God. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It's the announcement that God is willing to be reconciled. That he himself came in Jesus Christ. The, 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 work, the job is too big for anybody else. Too big for another Moses. Too big for the prophets. Too big for a creature. God himself had to come in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But that's the announcement. That's the good tidings. He's willing to be reconciled. To. Through the word of the cross. And so he has appointed us. Messengers. Ambassadors, says Paul. Heralds, that is, of this good news, verse 20. Commissioned by the great king, by Jesus Christ himself, to speak his message, his word of the cross, to speak his words, only his words, not our thoughts. Because Christ himself, he speaks through the preaching. He must speak through the preaching. Otherwise it's ineffective. Because the powers of him, chapter 4 and verse 7. But we have this treasure, and wonderful treasure it is, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The powers of him, the power to save. And of course this explains... This explains why that Paul has said in chapter 2 and, verse, and verses 15 and 16. The, um, the two part effect, to, to some it's the savour of life to life, and to others the savour of death unto death. But be assured, we cannot hear, we cannot hear his voice and remain neutral. Either we will hear his voice, and we will love his voice, and we will desire always to hear his voice, or we will loathe the very sound of it. My sheep, they hear my voice, they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Or Romans chapter 6, verse 9, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with the heart, and convert and be healed. But only his word. Only his word saves. Only the word of the cross. We have no other message. Only scripture, only the word of God in its fullness. Not anecdotes, not jokes, not entertainment. 
ambassadors are not sent for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and at verse 4, uh, we read, And my speech, says Paul, when I came amongst you, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Can you imagine a, an ambassador, the, the British ambassador to Russia, can you imagine him going delivering a message, terms of peace to Russia from the British government and entering into the Kremlin, into the presence of Mr. Putin and giving him anecdotes, telling him jokes, trying to entertain him. No. He goes with the message of his government and he speaks the words that his government has given him to speak and no other words. That's the task of an ambassador. So it must be the exposition of the word of God. What Jesus Christ himself has spoken, it must come out of the word of God, not the world's wisdom, not man's opinion hung upon the word of God. Knowing, knowing the terror of the Lord, persuading men, if we love them, beloved in Christ, if we love the people of the city of Lincoln, persuading men and women to be ready for this terrible day, this day when they will put off the body of the flesh. And stand before the judgment throne of God, beseeching them, appealing to them, verse 20, to be forgiven, to be reconciled to God. This same dying love of Jesus Christ for him, a wicked sinner, a blasphemer, and a violent man. This is what drove Paul's mission and if you had said to Paul, Paul, don't you think it's time you gave up? I mean, you, you've, been, you've been whipped and you've been stoned, you've been shipwrecked, you've been through all this stuff, and Paul, you're not a young man anymore. Don't you think it's time that you, you gave up, maybe retired? Paul would have looked at you like you'd come from another planet. No such thought in his mind. The cross, the love of God in the cross of his son, Jesus Christ, reconciling sinners such as he was to God, that they might have the peace of God, the love of God, the assurance of the peace and love of God, and the assurance of heaven when they put off the bodies of their flesh. Paul has no, no thought of quitting, of fainting, of giving up and neither must you knowing the terror of the Lord persuading men and women throughout the city of Lincoln whoever will listen to you urging them pressing them urgency beloved be reconciled to God we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God He is reconcilable. How? Through the word of the cross. Thirdly, the message of the cross. What is the message of the cross? Verse 21. For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. He who was utterly beautiful, sinless, no sin in him. For he hath made him to be sin for us in our place to take our sin. He who knew no sin, that in exchange, he taking what's ours and him giving us what is his. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is what constrains us. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all. Not all men head for head, 
all kinds of men and all kinds of women. Setting Christ crucified before him, before them, the word of the cross, the fact of his atonement, that God has done something about sin, about your sin, sir, your sin, madam, your sin, child. God has done something, something phenomenal. Sent his son into the world, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, gave him up to the death of the cross to shed his atoning blood so that you can be washed and made clean, your sin forgiven, reconciled to God, brought to know, to experience, to taste the love of God in all its fullness. He who was without sin, no guilt, but numbered, numbered with the transgressors. The beautiful, lovely Son of God, look at him on that cross, he said. A criminal, a vile criminal, bearing the curse of God. Because a man who was crucified, a man who was hung on a tree, you see, he was, neither, he was deemed to be neither fit for heaven nor fit for earth. That's why he's suspended. And that's what Jesus was bearing for us. Numbered with the transgressors, our substitute in my place, he stood. Taking our iniquities our place, living the life that we ought to have lived but cannot, and dying the death that we ought to have died but will not if we trust in Jesus Christ. And in him alone, in his soul-cleansing blood, shed for blasphemers, shed for violent men, shed for religious men and women, all kinds of sinners, the vilest offender, the hymn writer says, who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Made the righteousness of God so that when you stand before that judgment throne of God, God looks upon you as being perfectly righteous, a man or woman who never ever sinned in all your life long. And this comes to men and women, to children, via the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross. And faith, faith in the word of the cross. It's that that justifies. It's that that makes us right with God. By the word and by the operations of God's Holy Spirit. That's what God's Spirit uses, you see, to bring men and women to a realization, one of their need, and of course of the one that they desperately need. He uses the, it's the preaching of the cross that he uses to bring the conviction conviction of sin, the, the reality that we have sinned more than just, oh yes, we've, I, I, I've done wrong in my life, things I ought not to have done, not quite the same, but that I have, I have offended divine love. I have offended the love, of, the, the love and the law of God. I'm in trouble. The misery all the misery of my life, all my days that I have gone, what's the cause of it? They have a saying out there. They use the saying, look at her, she's as miserable as sin. Look at them, as miserable as sin. They know what causes it. But of course, they don't acknowledge it. But that's exactly what causes it. And powerless absolutely powerless, impotent, in the face of the ravages of sin, to do anything to lift ourselves up and out of it. And to wonderfully see, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, to shine the light on Jesus, not himself, 
You don't see him, he's hidden. He doesn't want to be seen. He's the shy member of the Godhead. You ever see a, one of those beautiful pictures of Edinburgh Castle in Scotland at night time? And it's all lit up glorious. And you see this glorious castle. But you don't see the lights around the bottom that are shining on the building. You're not supposed to see the lights. Yeah? They're there just to do a job. Shine the light on the castle. The Holy Spirit's work is to shine the light on Jesus. So that with that conviction of sin, you see him all glorious. Lifted up on that cross to die for me, Jesus, for me. You did this for me. That I might be reconciled to God through you. That I might know the infinite love of God and know the assured the joy of salvation and know the power of your forgiveness and know the assurance assurance of heaven that when I breathe my last and go out of this world and stand before God I will stand before him with confidence con Friday with faith. I'll stand before him in the beautiful, glorious righteousness of God. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful, faithful of faith servant. And then to enjoy the glories of heaven all the terror gone. All gone. But leaning, trusting, not working, because we're not saved by works. We cannot be saved by works. If you want to go that route, then I ask you, how much work do you have to do? What kind of work? How long do you have to live for and work for in order to satisfy God's justice? That's never ending. That's unanswerable. It's not by works that we are saved, but trusting, trusting, leaning upon the word of the cross, leaning upon the Son of God. Lean on me, says Jesus, lean on me. Yeah. Follow me. I'll lead you to heaven. I'll lead you to God. I'll lead you to forgiveness. Leaning upon the person, the lovely, beautiful person of Jesus. Who loved sinners and gave himself for them. To deliver them from the terrors of the Lord. Leaning upon his work, not yours. Because yours and mine's tainted with sin. The very best of our days tainted with sin. His work is perfect and glorious and satisfying to God. How do you know, you see? Because God raised him from the dead. That's how I know. And took him back to heaven. Faith. Faith. God's gracious gift of faith. Yeah. Christ the Lord. The person and work of the Son of God. Thus, in receiving the promise of God to those who will repent and believe the gospel, the promise of God, righteousness. Righteousness, just as if you had never sinned. Yeah? Pardon for your sins, pardon. A free pardon, a free pass. And accept it acceptance by God himself as being utterly and absolutely righteous. A mere acknowledgement of the gospel and the application of our, our own efforts. I mean, we, we've tried in the past, haven't we? We try, we, we try, we, we promise and we, we try so hard. I, I, I'll be good, I won't do it again. And, and, and the harder we try, the, the worse it becomes. It, it's, it's hopeless, it's, 
It's powerless. This is how you come. This is how you come empty handed. You come to the cross. You come to the cross and you stand there before, before the mighty Son of God. And, and stand there. I, I, I urge you, stand there. Stand there in, in the eye of faith and, and gaze upon him until you get it, until you understand it. I'm here doing this for you. But you come with nothing in your hand. Jesus, I've got nothing, nothing but my sin. I've got nothing. But I come to you because you bid me to. And here I am and I, I'm giving up. I'm giving up everything. I'm giving it all to you. No hope in myself. Or any other, any other, any other God. Any works, any religion, any religious activity. You must rest in Christ. That's not working. Rest. When you're resting, you don't, you're not working. When you're resting in Christ, you're not working. You're resting in him. You're leaning upon him, his person, because he's strong, he's mighty, and his works are perfect. So you rest in Christ and his work, his righteousness, not mine. I come to God in prayer. I come to God and, and, and I, I, I come to God, but you know, I don't come on the basis of my own performance. I dare not, on that basis, I dare not come. Not a day in my life goes by that I don't sin. come on the basis of the righteousness of another. Father, I'm here. I'm here uh, not because of me. I'm here because of your son, the one at your right hand. I'm here on the basis of his righteousness, not mine. His merit, not mine. But beloved, knowing this, knowing this, there's a living. Will we, shall we not seek to persuade men, to press them, to urge them, to beseech them, to pray that they be reconciled to God through Christ? Will we not seek as commanded? Search the scriptures, says Jesus. Because they testify of me. He's all over the Bible like a rash. He's there to be found. Give him, give him no rest until he comes, until you find him. Knock, 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 knock on his door and don't give up. That's how you find him. That's how you seek after him. And being justified. Justified made right with God. By the word of the cross. That moment that you believe. Truly believe in Jesus. God looks at you. And he sees. No sin at all. No sin at all. It's all gone. The old has passed away and the new has come. It's all gone. And the past is done with and dealt with. Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New life, new motives, new drive, new power, new everything, and a new and heavenly destination when you breathe your last and go out of this world without any fear, any fear whatsoever, but longing to depart, 
longing to go to be with Christ. The vilest offender, even Paul. But you must come to the cross. You must come to Christ. There is no other mediator between God and man. There is no other Savior. I am the way, the truth, and the life. None other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Christ and Christ alone. No other. And you come and you bring your sin to that cross and you leave it there because you're not taking it away with you again. He's going to take it away. Far away. So I urge you please to gaze once again upon that cross through the eye of faith and behold, behold, behold the profundity of his love. He so loved the world that he came and lived and died and rose again from the dead. He too, knowing the terror of the Lord, he did this that you might escape that. Through the, the utter profundity of his love. For 2,000 years, men have been trying to explain, trying to preach, trying to declare, trying to explain to men and women the profundity of the love of Jesus Christ for sinners. We still can't do it. Because it is so profound. It is so profound. I mean the depth of that in verse 21. Who can, who can plumb the depth of that? For he God hath made him sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. That's all I can say. Receive the grace of God. Trust in his son, Jesus Christ. And salvation, life 